clock strikes here it's always halloween and i'm always your haunted host luce tomlin brenner welcome to small frights friday on these very special episodes i like to curate a selection of calls from the all hollows hotline and letters from the eek mailbag but first Let's welcome our newest members of our Patreon ghoul gang, Nicole Solomon and Kristen Addison. Thank you so much for signing up for Patreon. Extra special thanks to Nicole for subscribing using our new annual membership option, which means to me that you extra super duper believe in us. Subscribing annually gives you two months of bonus goodies for free and It means you're going to have a front row seat as the podcast grows and grows and grows and terrifies a small village. Ah! Thank you so much to everyone who has subscribed so far. We are 80% funded. We're only $3 away from $400 a month. My goodness. And only $103 away from our first goal of $500 a month, which is how much it costs to produce this podcast each month. And if you are thinking about joining the Patreon, do it today because we have an incredible weekend coming up for all of you Halloween lovers. And I do mean Halloween. I'm right. I'm no John Carpenter, but I think I do pretty good with just my voice. So we pushed up the dates for our Halloween marathon. It is starting this weekend, September 18th and 19th. Our Halloween Marathon, Saturday, we do Halloween 1978, followed by Halloween 2, followed by Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, which has nothing to do with any of the other movies. Then the next day, we go into our very first timeline, which is Halloween 4, 5, and 6, The Return of Michael Myers, The Revenge of Michael Myers, and The Curse of Michael Myers. And 1, 2, 4, 5, 6 is one complete timeline. That's one story. So we'll be telling and exploring that story this weekend. And then in October... We'll be doing the other timeline, which is H2O and um, uh, Resurrection, the dumbest one, so I <laughs> have a hard time remembering it. So the other timeline is 1, 2, H2O, Resurrection, all right? And then on October 14th, we're going to do uh, Halloween 2018. That's the third timeline, Halloween 1978 and Halloween 2018, followed up by the very next day, we're gearing up. For the newest one, Halloween Kills in theaters October 15th. You can tell I am excited. Please join the Patreon this month. If you are interested in watching and discussing movies with us, we get really in-depth. We have a really fun discussion, and we're going to have a couple of special guests this weekend joining me for the discussion on video. And uh, I would love to have you guys there. Also, one more extra special treat. I'm inviting everyone who signs up for Patreon to our Saturday screening. Typically, you have to be at the $10 or $16 movie levels, but even if you signed up for the $1 level or the $3 level, any level is invited on Saturday to watch one, two, and three with us. That is my Halloween gift, my full-size bar to everybody who has signed up for Patreon. So now is the time, if you're thinking about it, don't miss out on this triple feature that we're going to have Saturday and Sunday back to back. Haven't done anything like this. Might I get a little wacky by the very end? I might. Go to patreon.com slash it's always Halloween to see me in my full wackiness and sign up now. Special shout out to today's sponsor, Lantern Todd Norris is sponsoring today's episode. 
you too could sponsor an episode by uh, clicking the tip jar and doing a one-time donation of $30 or more. And then you have the distinct pleasure of knowing that your money is paying for that episode that we make. So thank you so much, Todd Norris. We appreciate your belief in the podcast and um, it's so great to have your support. So in the show notes, you can find our links to Patreon. You can find the link to the tip jar if you want to just make a one-time donation. Everything helps keep us independent, ad-free, and sustainable. Now, before we jump in the episode, we're talking about movies. I saw... Candyman this week. I'm only going to say it once. Maybe. We'll see. I'll try not. There's no mirrors in my closet, in the pod closet. So I think I'm okay, but better safe than sorry. The biggest problem is uh, with the these movies are white people not knowing when to keep their nose out of the business. So I'm trying not to say it again. I got to go to this movie with two cool gang members who live in LA. Alisa Marcus and um, Samantha McBride. Thank you so much for joining me. That was so much fun. And I was delighted. I absolutely love the original. And I found the second one to be an incredible follow up, further explored and pushed out the folklore of the story. And it was scary and gross and beautiful and tragic and sad. And we shrieked. I shrieked a lot. There were many gross parts. Um, for those of you who describe yourselves as gentle, I don't think this one is necessarily for you at the same time. It has such an incredible story. Not a lot of jump scares, but some definite, um, gore and body horror that I'm not a super fan of lots of little holes. Anybody else out there have the whole fear, the little holes, the honeycomb hole fear. Yeah. Ooh, I was really, um, really on the edge of my seat because I was like melting off of it by the end. <laughs> but I'm really happy with it. And, you know, we need more uh, black women in horror. Nia DaCosta, this was uh, not her first film, but first major horror studio film. Her last film, Little Woods, uh, starring Tessa Thompson. Very good. Highly recommend. And uh, she co-wrote the script for uh, this new one with Jordan Peele. And it's just I think it's a triumph. I loved it so much. It's got incredible humor and incredible horror. And to me, it's exactly what I want from horror movies and exactly what I want to see more of. Just want to encourage you to go to see it in the theater if you do feel comfortable seeing it in theaters because women directors, especially black women directors, do not get the same boost that big budget male directors tend to get when their films come out. And this um, fall, we got a lot of big horror movies coming out made by men, a lot that I'm really excited about. It's not, there's nothing wrong with it except for the fact that due to just a generalized baked in sexism of, of our culture, there's just a, people don't support movies made by women as much. And I am an emerging female director and I want to just put that out there that like women need a boost uh, in the theater to overcome, you know, centuries of oppression. <laughs> And the thing I love about horror is the way that it examines um, and subverts some of the atrocities in our society and explores them in a way that feels, uh, you know, fun and not luxury. So I hope that you guys get a chance to go see us in the theater if you feel comfortable. I had so much fun. I also had the pleasure of seeing the 2001 movie Pulse. It's a J-horror, uh, Japanese horror. I got to see it in the theater projected last night. And... Pulse is easily the most disturbing film I've ever seen. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, it's got incredibly discordant music that stayed with me all night, especially in the middle of the night. Both after both of these films, I was I willed myself to not get up and pee in the middle of the night because I just couldn't handle being in a room with a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> at like 3 a.m., the witching hour, I was like, just stay in bed until it's light out again. Uh, so I had a really great week of horror movies. Recommend both of those. And uh, I'd love to hear what you guys are watching. In fact, I have an eek mail right here from a lantern who has some movie recommendations for us. Should we dive in, hear what they have to say? I think so. The subject line for this one is more Halloween movie suggestions. Ah, oh, we can never have enough. 
say, my name is Mikey, and I first want to say thank you for making this amazing podcast. I wasn't able to find a mainly Halloween-focused podcast before you made this one, so I'm glad I have this podcast to listen to now. But here's a quick suggestion for scary story lovers. I listen to the Scared to Death podcast hosted by the stand-up comedian Dan Cummins and his wife, who are both horror lovers. So that's a great podcast for people who like scary stories. Now, getting to my point, I have about a handful of your episodes left to listen to, and I have yet to hear anyone bring up two of my family-friendly Halloween movies, but I was reminded of these two films since everyone was talking about the Halloween tree movie. These are called The Scary Godmother and The Scary Godmother Revenge of Jimmy, both made by Jill Thompson. And to go with the story of these movies, she also wrote two or three kids' books as well as two or three graphic novels, all of which add to the Scary Godmother story. Just a quick explanation for those who haven't seen these movies. The story is that the Scary Godmother lives in another universe. Ugh, other universe stuff always freaks me out. But she hosts Halloween parties at her house every year which are attended by monsters and creatures of the night. Until one day, a human little girl stumbles upon a way to get to her party. So to know the rest, you'll just have to watch the movies. I have included the link to both full movies on YouTube below in case you want to watch them yourself and share them with everyone else. And you can also buy these movies on Amazon. I used to love watching these on TV with my mom every year when I was little, until they stopped airing on TV. And now that I'm older, I introduced these movies to my wife a few years ago, and now she loves them so much we watch them every year together like tradition. Okay, well, I hope everyone has a very spooky day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Mikey, thanks so much for that terrific eek mail. I have started to hear about the scary godmother films and books just from people discussing them out and about on the internet, but I, they totally missed me before I started this podcast, and I thank you for including the links to the movies. They're both over 45 minutes, so I didn't have a chance to watch both before recording this episode, but what I did watch of the first one was super fun. It's definitely family friendly. So great for any of our uh, listeners who like that cozy vibe and aren't looking for something that has too much horror in it. I did find the animation to be quite uncanny valley, however, uh, and definitely gave me a bizarre, uncomfortable feeling despite the fact that it's not traditionally horrifying. I was reading a little bit about it, and um, I think one of the reasons I missed these is because they originally debuted in Europe and Canada and Latin America, and then later they came to Cartoon Network, but by the time that happened, I was in college, so I think I was probably more at the height of my pretentious film nerd uh, attitude, and I wasn't watching anything made for children. My God, if it's not on Criterion or the horrific horror movie, I don't want anything to do with it. I'm a very serious grown-up now that I am in college and taking film classes. That was a very accurate portrayal of me several years ago. Now I am much more of a delight, much easier to be around. <laughs> the best thing about being in your 30s is learning to chill out and liking whatever you like and not feeling like you have to be performative for anybody. It's very comforting, very relaxing. I recommend turning 30. Um, all right, so Scary Godmother uh, is a series of books and comic books, like Mikey told us, uh, created by the artist Jill Thompson. And uh, they started in 1997, and the illustrations are so pretty. I really, I actually like the way the illustrations of a book look a little more than the style of animation for the movies. But uh, like I said, both seem very fun, and it looks like there is uh, like a dozen comic books. So this could be a really fun Halloween excursion for especially any of our younger listeners who enjoy uh, like YA type comic books. I wanted to touch real quick on some of the monsters that are in these stories because the names are super fun. First we have Mr. Scully Pettibone, 
one of the scary godmother's roommates. I hope that this series is filled with this type of wordplay. Uh, so Mr. Scully Pettibone is a skeleton that hides in people's closets to keep their secrets safe. And as he puts it, just to rattle around. <laughs> um, and then there's Bugaboo, a round monster with multiple yellow eyes, fur, and a pointy tail. Harry, a talkative werewolf who wears a lamb patterned shirt. Wow, I guess that's like us wearing like pizza on our shirts or like little polka dot burgers. Uh, Count Max, a tall, thin, bald vampire who dresses all in black. Ruby, a beautiful wife. Max's beautiful wife, not just a beautiful wife. <laughs> Max's beautiful wife, who is also a vampire. Oh, so the scariest thing being reduced to just a wife. And then uh, Orson, Max and Ruby's preteen son, who is also a vampire. He is the prince of the night. <laughs> Um, these look super fun. So thank you for sharing them with us, Mikey. And I will drop links to the movies in our show notes so that people can check them out and become new fans. Up next, let's take a call from the All Hallows Hotline. Hi, Luce. My name is Samantha and I'm a new listener and I've been absolutely loving your podcast. I'm currently using it as my break between study sessions, and it gives me all of the happy and cozy feelings that come along with the sweet Halloween season. I wanted to give a call about my own cozy Halloween memory. Halloween has always been special to me because my birthday falls in October. Ever since I could remember, I've been having Halloween-themed birthday parties, and my dad's always went the extra mile to make it really special. One of these early memories of my birthday parties was a hallowed birthday where my dad made a cutout booth where there was a painted witch, a mummy, and a creature. We also had your favorite Halloween game, bobbing for apples, and lots of other fun Halloween trinkets that you'd find in those little Halloween gift baggies. Jokes aside, it was such a memorable and special evening with my friends. I really enjoyed that everyone could dress up at my Hallow birthday. I'll share one more micro Hallow memory. Each year, on the eve of All Hallows Eve, my dad and I would drive around and scope out the best Halloween candy spots. In other words, the houses that had the best decorations. And we would start by taking out a special orange cassette that had a Halloween musical selection curated by my dad. Once the Halloween music was going and we were singing along to Monster Mash, we would drive around town and write down the names of the streets that we would hit the next day. Some things I'm planning to do with my friends this Halloween season are going to an old town ghost tour um, that we're really looking forward to in this creepy little spot in Alexandria, Virginia. We're also planning to go to a pumpkin patch and seeing if there are any fall fairs. Something I do to keep Halloween going all year round is shopping at art or um, Etsy shops that have little knickknacks or other local small businesses of Halloween nature. I recently just bought some stickers from the shop you recommended, Bundy, and they look oh so cute, and I'm really excited for them to come in. I hope you enjoyed these sweet Halloween memories. Thank you for all the joy you've brought me through this podcast, and I hope you have a really happy Halloween. Bye! Oh, Samantha, that was quite the cozy call. Your voice is so soothing and sweet. Thank you so much for uh, leaving such a wonderful message. Um, I have done the ghost tour of Old Town Alexandria. I used to live in Silver Spring, Maryland for four years between 2008 and 2012. And I uh, absolutely loved the DMV area. So I think you will adore the ghost tour. Alexandria is a really interesting town with a lot of history definitely recommend. And then you said you're looking for pumpkin patches. So I want to recommend my favorite pumpkin patch in the entire mid-Atlantic region. So this goes for anybody, you know, in Maryland, DC, Virginia, you must go to Lairland Farms in Woodbine, Maryland. It's a little far. Uh, it's just east. It's a little far for you in Virginia, but it's, um, 
excuse me, it's just west of Baltimore off uh, I-70, and then it's just north of Germantown and Gaithersburg off of 270. So where I lived in Silver Spring, it was like a 30 minute drive and you go through the most beautiful hills and there's so much like gorgeous like trees and farmland and if you go in October when all the leaves are changing it is the perfect autumny drive and we've been to Butler's Orchard as well which I like but there is just nothing like Laraland Farms it's on a giant Uh, plot of land. They have incredible apple cider donuts and apple fritters and apple cider slushies. They have a really fun hayride that takes you through the woods and they have all these little scenes set up that's um, pretty family friendly, but it's still like cute and spooky. They also have a petting farm with llamas or perhaps alpacas. I don't remember which. Um, And you can get like all the pumpkins and gourds and things that you like. There's also um, the opportunity to pick your own. And so you can, uh, you know, sign up for that separately or you can go through the bins of what they pick for you. But it is my favorite hayride experience and just like autumnal experience overall. So if you're in the DMV area, you have to go to Laraland Farms. Highly, highly recommend. I've been searching for an orchard that makes me as happy as that place made me. And it just like does not really exist out here in LA. It's just too populous. It's too hot. Everything is like dusty and mountainy and doesn't really have that bucolic rolling hills autumnal vibe. So I need to stop like trying to shoehorn it in because it's, I think I'm, I don't know. I'm still going to try to go probably do a pumpkin patch this year, but it's always just a little disappointing because it's just hard to get that same Midwest or East Coast vibe when it's like 100 degrees. <laughs> uh, my biggest issue, but we don't have we don't have winter, so I know it's a trade off. Um, happy almost birthday! I'm curious if you fall on the Libra side of October or the Scorpio side of October. If you'll remember, I am a Scorpio, so. Always happy to welcome in my fellow Scorps, especially if you are born in October. I think it's so cool that you get to celebrate your birthday and Halloween at the same time. Your dad sounds amazing, and I'm glad you have really good memories of apple bobbing. (laughs) Um, My one, two of my closest friends, actually, their birthdays are on Halloween. Shout out to Emma Cogan and Madison Shepard, my Hello Queens. I'm very jealous of you. Um, I guess I could make myself a Halloween themed birthday. This is something I've never considered before and it's just dawning on me. Since my birthday is November 20th, that would be such a fun way to extend the holiday. Just force everybody like you have to dress up in costumes and then we'll all like carve jack-o'-lanterns. Um, let's think about this. That could be very, that could be very delightful. Thank you for inspiring me, Samantha. Oh, I especially love that your dad was down to hunt for the best possible houses to hit up for candy. My mom was like so strict about like, we were only staying in this neighborhood and we were only doing these blocks. And she was so uh, annoyed when kids came in from different neighborhoods. It was very much under the, you know, presumption that you had to stay stay in your spot. But you know, the older I've gotten, the more I realize that we all live in a lot, very vastly different places. So neighborhoods that are really good for Halloween, you know, that's great. I grew up in a place where almost everybody had their lights on for Halloween. We were never wanting for candy options, but tons of other kids could have been coming from places like apartments or rural areas or just, you know, blocks of older people who aren't necessarily trying to give out, stay up late and give out candy to kids. Stay up late. Trick or treat goes to seven. Um, (laughs) So I really like that your dad was focused on like hitting up the best houses. And that's a story I hear a lot from siblings putting together a Halloween map. But I just think it's really special that uh, your dad encouraged that. And While I am not totally sold on whether or not um, children are for me yet to physically have my own, I do. When I hear stories like this, it does just make me just the idea of like doing something like that for my child. uh, It just like makes my heart go splat. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's all warm and gooey. I just want to, I love doing Halloween for children. When I was a nanny, it was like my favorite thing was getting the girls ready for Halloween and doing their makeup and doing like their nails and taking them to get their costumes. Just very, very fulfilling. Um, if only there wasn't all that other stuff. <laughs> If only they didn't cost money and keep you up at night <laughs> in the early days. There's pros and cons, I'm sure. I would love to hear from parents and how you make your Halloween special for your kids. And um, if you have a lot of fun with your kids at Halloween, I would love to hear those stories. All right, Samantha, you're the best. Welcome to the podcast. And we look forward to hearing more coziness from you soon. All right, this next email is titled Ghostbusters Busted. Hello, Luce. I've been a member of the Ghoul Gang since the very beginning, but I never knew exactly what to call or to email about. Every time I listened to a new episode, the stories from the other lanterns were always so amazing that I felt like I could never compare. My decorations can't hold a black flamed candle to the spreads everyone else has been showing off on our Discord. My store-bought costumes will never terrify like the makeup of your other ghoulish patrons. I'm in Oregon, far from the SoCal or New England meetup opportunities, but hey, all of our experiences are unique and valid, and I decided I needed to find at least one story to send into the eek mailbag before another Halloween had come and gone. This is the most amount of ease I've ever seen in the word eek mail, and I love it. Thank you. My family was never too spooky. My mother was a believer in the satanic panic of the 1980s, oh, oh boy, and there was an ever-growing list of media that she will, quote, never allow in her house. So she is now strictly church parking lot trunk or treat, but in 1986, her love of decorating outweighed her fears, so there were still jack-o'-lanterns and a tiny bit of spooky spirit to be had. Ah. Oh. I love that. Decorating wins out every time. <laughs> That's how the devil gets to us, through jack-o'-lanterns, <laughs> through Martha Stewart spreads. <laughs> In second grade, we moved to a nice ranch-style house on the corner of a round street called Emerald Loop. I had to look that over twice. A round street. I'm picturing... <laughs> I picture like a roller coaster loop. Like, wow, incredible. I do think there was like a micro machines uh, play set when I was a kid that did have a, a looped road like that. Uh, okay, so the round street was called Emerald Loop, and it was in a small town suburb that is called Cornelius in Oregon. The house had several arborvitae out front, and when Halloween came around, they were inner girl to our decorations. The tall one by our kitchen window was buttoned into a flannel shirt with a straw hat tied to the top to create a scarecrow. The two smaller shrubs out front were draped in sheets with eyes cut out to make ghosts. Add the two jack-o'-lanterns carved by myself and my older sister, and you have a perfectly average trick-or-treat destination. <laughs> As the days passed, though, we would come home to find the sheets flung off our shrubbery ghosts, sometimes on the lawn, sometimes on a shrub next door, or even on the sidewalk. Knots were tied, safety pins were fastened, but still they were taken off. We watched them cling to the branches through rain and wind, so this was no natural occurrence. Turns out we had a ghostbuster in our neighborhood. My father was always looking for an excuse to play with his newest gadgets, so he set up his tripod in my bedroom window and programmed his state-of-the-art Panasonic Omnimovie VHS recorder <laughs> and had it record a few seconds every five minutes over the course of the day. <laughs> Very paranormal activity of your dad. Sure enough, that Monday, between the 2.55 p.m. and the 3 p.m. spots, the sheets were taken off. A chat with the friendly retiree across the street told us that this was the time the school bus came around to the neighborhood. My father reset his camera to record the 20 minute period around 3 p.m. and sure enough, five terrible frames of video captured two young miscreants in puffy coats running past the house and flinging off the sheets. 
After dinner that evening, my father pulled the footage up on our 16-inch Commodore 64 monitor and asked if I recognized the kids since they looked to be about my age. I explained that I had no idea. Our district had open enrollment, so the school bus on our corner was from a completely different elementary school. Not to be deterred, my parents considered, considered the direction the kids ran. Emerald Loop was a small street of only a dozen or so houses, so that Saturday, my mother and father had us bundle up as we all took a walk around the loop to knock on every door to find the Ghostbusters parents. <laughs> oh my god, this is so embarrassing. I, it's like one thing if your parents went on their own, but they took you with them. <laughs> To, try, to track down these kids. Oh my God. After one or two houses, my enthusiasm for justice waned as I realized how embarrassing it all was. Yes, it's very embarrassing. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. I'm having like the secondhand cringe right now. I couldn't help but feel pity when we finally spoke to the mother of the guilty party. She looked at the footage and called her son to the door to apologize. He was just another second grade boy whom I had never met, but I could empathize with instantly. <laughs> oh, no. The ghost busting stopped and our decorations remained unsullied for the rest of the month. But at what cost? I can only hope that my father's surveillance and my mother's stern talking to did not spoil that little boy's Halloween or worse, ruin the holiday for him forever. <laughs> Oh no. In closing, I hope that any of our ghoul gang members can show mercy on the little rascals that might make a mess of their decoration. What's a smashed pumpkin or a toppled front yard gravestone to the joys of the season? There will always be a few tricks along with the treats. Thanks again to you, Luce and Pete, for everything you do to make the podcast happen. Thanks to my fellow Lanterns for building such an incredible community. See you online. Happy Halloween to everyone. Tom the Fanboy. Tom, my goodness. You have me cracking up with this eek mail. I can't. <laughs> Just picturing you all bundled up being shuffled to house to house being like, please watch this video. Is this your little boy? <laughs> This is such a good memory. I'm so happy that you shared it with us. And my heart definitely goes out to that little second grader. Hey, did this happen to you listeners? I need to know. Wouldn't you just love it if the person this happened to was a fellow lantern and they were like, it didn't ruin the holiday. I love it. And we could connect you two over email. That would just uh, light me up. Just like those kids who got their ankles grabbed in our Trick or Treat Grab Your Feet episode. I'm just dying to eventually connect a trickster with um, the person who was like, hey now, <laughs> the tricky, the trickster with the tricky. Uh, this is wonderful. I am happy that you guys got to the bottom of it, but I'm kind of sad it wasn't that like your bushes were haunted or something like that. <laughs> Um, you know, when I was really little, I want to say like kindergarten or first grade, we had someone smash our pumpkins and it like destroyed me. Um, like I was so hurt because it was like, I don't know, one of the first times I carved pumpkins cause you know, like five or six year old hands are like your, your, your fine motor skills take a little bit to develop. And it was like, I think the first year that I was like, let's decorate the house for Halloween, that I was like really getting into Halloween. And I was so devastated. They like ripped our decorations down. And I'm sure it was like prankster teens, but I do really appreciate, Tom, you coming from um, a place of forgiveness and uh, of like, you know, mischief, kids will be kids. Uh, and I do want adults to, you know, not be hard on children because their brains aren't fully formed yet. And, um, you know, people all come from different backgrounds with different values and we're all just trying to work it out. But I do want to say that that does, you know, sometimes also hurt other children and that it's, um, you know, tricks are one thing, maybe like a little TPing, a little uh, silly stringing, 
but uh, you know, wrecking people's stuff is such a bummer. Um, but again, an eight-year-old child flinging a couple of sheets off the bushes, not quite the same thing as smashing jack-o'-lanterns. My just my little like six-year-old inside of me is just like, oh, so sad still every time I look upon that memory. I have to say, you made me laugh so hard when you said that, <laughs> that the decorations were perfectly average. <laughs> I just think it's so cool, though, that you guys did a DIY spread, and I think that we should be applauding that kind of ingenuity and, like, making do with what you have. Like, we all can't buy, you know, the $300 six-foot skeletons or six-foot. Oh, please, nobody wants to buy a six-foot skeleton. It's a 12-foot skeleton, but of course. Um <laughs> But yeah, we can't all do like the huge lawn ornaments. So I think if you tie some uh, sheets around your bushes and make them little ghosts, that is not only perfectly adequate, but perfectly cromulent. And I love that you guys did that. I think it's super fun. And then I also just want to thank Tom. He was one of the earliest listeners and he made the first ever It's Always Halloween meme, which I saved because it made me so happy because it was a Brooklyn Nine-Nine reference, which is one of my favorite shows, non-spooky shows. Um, and I will throw that up on the Instagram and, um, I just want you to know, Tom, that I have it saved in my It's Always Halloween folder, and I always go back and look at it, and I'm like, hee, 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 I love it. So you brought me lots of joy with that meme last September. Thank you for being such a dedicated lantern from the very beginning. And I uh, absolutely loved this eek mail. What a delight. I, I want to hear more stories like this from lanterns about how you decorated as a kid and if you were the victim of a ghostbuster or perhaps you were a little mischief maker yourself i think that would be very fun to hear about all right guys i have a very fun announcement for you so on past episodes i've talked about ween dream that's w e e n dream ween dream which is a costume charity in um based in louisiana jefferson louisiana and what they do is they get costumes to kids who are not able to get costumes for themselves. And uh, they also do Halloween decor and all the various accoutrements that you might need for Halloween. So a really great lantern uh, brought them to my attention uh, in the last year. And like I said, we have talked about them in a few other episodes. You can check them out on their website which I will link in the show notes and their Instagram is at ween underscore dream. And they had a few weeks where they were dealing with the fallout from Hurricane Ida. And now they have posted a really great update that I wanted to share with you guys because you all have such big hearts and you really understand the community aspect of Halloween and how it's about sharing with each other and creating a special holiday that we can all enjoy. So I knew that you would just jump at the chance to help kids who are in need of a special Halloween. So what they need this year, uh, there's a few different things. You can make a monetary donation at the link in their Instagram bio. I will put that link in the show notes. Uh, they especially like $10, $13, and $31. This will help them buy and ship costumes directly to their weensters, which is what they call the families in need of costumes. You can also become a pumpkin patch sponsor. That means that you shop and send a costume directly and anonymously to a weenster. And you can email Allie at weendream.org to get on that list. That's spelled Allie, A-L-L-I, at ween, W-E-E-N, dream, dot org. Uh, then spread the word. Uh, I will be posting about it on Instagram and Twitter, and you should do that as well. And they are asking that people not send in costume or decoration donations right now because their headquarters is still kind of waterlogged and they're not sure if they can process anymore at the moment. So this year, what they're looking for is direct monetary contributions, or if you want to shop and send a costume directly. I really like that idea specifically because it just sounds really fun to go to the costume store and look for um, the costumes that a child 
really wants and to know that you're directly able to fulfill a child's Halloween wish. So again, I will be putting all the information in the show notes. And if you have anything to spare, then please send it to Ween Dream or help and get a costume to a kid in need and uh, know that you can pass on all those good cozy feelings that you love to uh, someone who really needs it this year. All right, Lanterns, do you have a favorite costume that you wore growing up? Do you have somebody that ruined your life with Halloween pranks? Do you have an orchard that you're as obsessed with as I am with Laryland Farm? Please call in to the All Hallows hotline at 802-532-DEAD or write us an incredible eek mail at it's always Halloween podcast at gmail.com. As soon as I said it, I realized I put too much pressure on it. It doesn't have to be incredible. When I say incredible, I think everything that everyone writes in is incredible because all of them make me laugh. They make my heart feel big and full. They create a sense of wonder and whimsy and mystery and good feelings in me. So I just want to, you know, I wanted to reiterate this when Tom wrote this in his email too. Everything that you guys share is special and I really enjoy it. And it creates a sense of connection and community during a time when I think we still really desperately need it. So don't be too hard on yourselves. And um, Tom, just <laughs> you wrote such an incredible letter. So to know that you were unsure if you had anything to share. I mean, we all play our own memories back and forth in our own heads so many times that they seem boring and unnecessary. And who's going to care? And like, if you're not a performer, or you're not a writer, you may not think you're able to convey a message uh, a way that other people perhaps are able to. But Listen, you I guarantee you're a lot more interesting than you're giving yourself credit for. And as somebody who's been in comedy for over 10 years, there's a ton of people who are up on stage not being half as interesting as you guys are. And they all have the hubris to call themselves comedians, performers. Many of them have never entertained me. You all have definitely entertained me. So please write, call in. Don't second guess yourself. If you have already left us a message or an eek mail and you haven't heard it yet, that is not because it's not good. It's just because I'm trying to get through all of them every week. So um, feel free to call or write again if you didn't get yours played yet. Or just say, hey, <laughs> I'm here and I enjoy the podcast. Just wanted you to know I get those messages a lot too and they always really make my day. As I said at the top of the episode, if you're enjoying It's Always Halloween, then please subscribe on our Patreon at patreon.com slash it's always Halloween. If you sign up before 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Saturday, you can join us for our Halloween franchise marathon. Typically, you get two movies a month. This month, you're getting six movies. Next month, you're getting four movies. It's going to be pretty fantastic, guys. Uh, if you don't want to commit to a monthly subscription, I totally understand. Please use our tip jar, which is also in the show notes. Once again, I want to thank the sponsor of today's episode, Todd Norris. Thank you, Todd. You made it so that we could produce this episode. Your donation means so much. And to everyone who has done a one-time donation via the tip jar or Venmo, it all went right back into producing this podcast, and I'm very grateful. If you want to, you can also buy our merch on Redbubble. And finally, if you need a free way to support the podcast, just leave us a review on Apple. That makes a huge difference. And last week, I encouraged people to leave a simple message, a simple review. I said it did not have to be super long. It did not have to be super involved. And you guys took me up on that, and I got a lot of really nice, just direct couple of sentences. And I wanted to thank you for following through on that. Um, the last one we got was love this podcast. If you love Halloween, this is the podcast for you. I love the intro song. Something about it just feels so nostalgic. I think the host is amazing. And I think she's super fun to listen to. And then a bunch of cute Halloween emojis. That's from Luna Witch. Thank you so much, Luna Witch. Another one, such a fun show. Each episode is more informative and exciting than the last. That's from Beza Ozar. Thank you so much, Beza. And on and on, you guys have done so much to help promote the podcast. I've got a lot of really great Instagram shout outs lately. And please know that makes a huge difference. Every time somebody posts about it and tags me 
in their Instagram stories or posts, we get like five to 10 new followers. And I think a few of those people then also translate into listeners. And I mean, word of mouth is really everything, guys. So thank you. Today's episode was performed by me, Luce Tomlin Brenner, with some incredible help from our lovely lanterns, Tom, Mikey, and Samantha. The editing, sound design, and theme music is by Pete Burns. Thanks, Pete. You can follow me at Instagram and Twitter at LTB Comedy and Pete at Mittenberries. Don't forget, you can also subscribe on the NPR One app and be sure to tell Ira Glass that I love him. Thanks so much for listening to yet another episode of It's Always Halloween and make sure to come back next time unless you got grounded for destroying someone's Halloween decorations. Yeah.